Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we're joined by Camden Spiller, CEO of Maddox Industrial Transformers. We talk about electrical infrastructure, including the consequences of the pandemic, tapering demand from Bitcoin miners, and how demand destruction is easing production concerns. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Foundry Digital. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. As a premier training and education program for professional mining technicians, Foundry Academy answers. From hands-on ASIC labs taught by industry veteran instructors to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact, Foundry Academy graduates acquire the skills facilities need to be off and mining. They've even built OSHA 10 certification into the curriculum. Open to all who hold a high school degree or equivalent, the next one-week course taking place in Rochester, New York, runs September 12th through the 17th. Visit foundryacademy.com to register or reach out to academy at foundrydigital.com. Camden, welcome to the Compass Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Will. It's great to be here. No, great to be here. Is it a how's uh, how are things in Denver? You know, it's hot. It's hot all across the U.S. right now. But I am yeah. uh, I don't love it because Colorado is not supposed to be like that. Most people most people think this state is completely covered in snow, and it's true for <laughs> parts of it. But the eastern slope where I'm from gets pretty hot during the summer, and it's only been getting hotter like every summer. I feel like. And I'm, I'm a little over it, but yeah. how, how about things on your side? Yeah, no, it's great. We're right out here. I'm out here, right? Just North of uh, Portland, Oregon. So it is uh, nice and cool sixties and uh, it's, it's beautiful to be out, but we've got, we've got a lot <laughs> of our team in Texas right now. And uh, so oh. that's uh, uh, Texas and South Carolina. So uh, we've got big projects in both places right now. Yeah. So uh, that heat is, uh, is certainly not good on electrical infrastructure. So it's, uh, it's stressful on us uh, uh, to yeah. say the least. Yeah, no, that's that's great. We've talked about that so many times on the podcast the last four to eight weeks is this big North American heat wave. And maybe it's not really a heat wave, it's just called summer, right? When we have <laughs> a lot of Bitcoin mines for Compass have problems with it. And then, you know, there's miners all over the industry, the public miners, we get some nice information from them when they disclose their investor notes at the end of the month. And you know, a lot of them have been suffering from offline time just because of the heat. And it's just, just part of the, the game. Um, from the electrical standpoint, that's interesting as well. So you guys have teams in Texas and South Carolina. Let's actually delve into it, Maddox itself. Yeah. So just to give you some some background, so we um, our business is exclusively focused on industrial transformer uh, industrial transformers, and this this primarily has to do with three phase equipment. Um, your typical pad mount transformer that's going to be outside of um, of any commercial industrial facility. To our domain here, uh, outside any any large mining operation, that's our that's our bread and butter. The liquid cooled pad mount transformer. Of course, we also do the substation transformers. Those are kind of the big guys that would feed a whole array of pad mounts, uh, and the little guys, the little um, you know, like your seventy five kVA or your small air cooled transformer that's going to be inside. Now, I'm speaking of small, but you know, small on an industrial scale. Um, you know, something that's providing like you know. 200 amps or something like that. So, um, but uh, yeah, everything along that spectrum is our business. Um, I've been in the space about 20, um, 20 something years, 24 or five years. Um, and, uh, you know, watching the, the, I'll just say professionalization of uh, the crypto space has been, been super interesting over the last few years. You know, we would go to a, a, a mining infrastructure conference, um, four or five years ago and it was pretty wild west man i mean there were guys like doing stuff that it's like oh you shouldn't do that with that equipment but <laughs> uh, it was frankly a little scary but um you know a lot of um the the best practices from from other other industries uh have, have come in some of this is is uh is is partly due to the capital behind these projects now, and uh, you know the the mega mines, the big you know the big um, highly engineered um, projects, which we've been very very involved with from the start, uh, have uh, have imported some of those best practices, have have uh, really really helped to um, to get better better system design across the board. So we've kind of been able to be a, be a part of that, and uh, and so that's that's been interesting to watch. Yeah, that leads perfectly into my first question of just about your guys' business in general. What was your guys' 
daily activity? Who gets to tell oh, yeah. to? Yeah. So it's a great question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, crypto mining, we were, we were in this early um, just by virtue of our, um, our, our interest in, in the space. And uh, we've had several guys, um, several guys who, who really focused on this space and helped out with some, some early kind of infrastructure uh, planning projects. And that enabled us to get an early foothold. But our, our core business is commercial industrial. So uh, it's going to be anybody, uh, anything from building a, uh, maybe a, a shopping mall that requires, you know, just you know, lighting and air conditioning and, you know, all the typical uses of industrial power to heavy, heavy manufacturing, uh, you know, then maybe that's semiconductor manufacturing or, uh, you know, melting steel, anything, any, any big power user is, is our customer. So it's, uh, yeah, it's anything from the the Seven Eleven to um, SpaceX and um, NASA stuff, and of course uh, the Tesla projects have been fun lately, kind of high high profile projects. Um, but um, but it's a lot of you know real non sexy stuff too. It's like you know the warehouse for you know a distribution center or you know all that kind of stuff. So the the crypto um, uh, the mining space is is something that we were early in and have have a big presence in i think we've put about i think we put about 1.5 gigawatts online this year uh year to date um so i I, we kind of pay attention to what we're doing and uh, i don't really have numbers on you know what other guys are doing but we think that's a lot it's it's, it sounds like a lot to us so yeah no it's interesting that you guys work with such a a wide swath of electrical uh, infrastructure needs yeah, it's uh, right, exactly, and that has that has been. I, th- I think that's been helpful as, as we were talking about before about kind of importing best practices from other industries to the the crypto space. That's uh, that's where we've been able to play that role because you know we see you know um, you know certain things done on other heavy demand uh, uh, projects and 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 can help kind of translate some of that uh, in. in crypto design but it's yeah every it's everything on demand side and then also on somewhat on the generation side you know we'll work with um with solar projects or um some some amount of wind projects but um you know those guys are kind of doing the inverse thing they're in instead of consuming power they're producing power but it all needs to be transformed to go on or or to come off of the grid and so we're on we're on both sides of that Okay, this is, this is leading me to a question I didn't think I was going to ask, but what yeah. has been the experience working with Bitcoin miners? You mentioned a second ago no. that in the early days, it's been chaotic and maybe a little bit dangerous, sure. which isn't necessarily <laughs> shocking to me. Uh, sure, but now, sure. you know, 2022, we have, we have mega mines, right? With 750 oh, yeah. uh, megawatts at one farm, uh, oh, yeah. stuff of that size. What has it been like? How have you seen the professionalization? And yeah. have you seen sort of gradations of it across different sizes of miners or is it definitely becoming more professionalized just as a class? Great question. Yeah. So it it is as a as a class and generally, but more specifically, we see, you know, being involved in, in those those mega mines, um, we see those guys taking seriously uh, you know, design, uh, you know, let's let's size the equipment appropriate for the demand. We've seen um, we've seen hard lessons learned. We've seen big projects where guys have burned up, you know, many, many millions of dollars worth of equipment and kind of had a Kind of, kind of had a uh, a run to failure approach with the electrical infrastructure equipment, uh, in the same way you would, uh, you would maybe treating electrical equipment the way you would treat electronic equipment. And there's there's some similarities, but there's differences. We've kind of used these analogies of, uh, you know, everybody's comfortable. I mean, I grew up in in software, and you know, you know, putting together computer hardware, all that kind of stuff. So I understand. And, you know, we're all very comfortable overclocking a processor. We know what that does. We know the consequences. We know how to, um, you know, mitigate the the effects and deal with it. Uh, Overclocking electrical infrastructure, uh, if you can't, there's, you can say that and you know what I mean, but it's, it's not exactly the same thing, but overburdening 
that kind of uh, that kind of infrastructure uh, is 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 not the same. It has very serious effects. It, it burns up stuff. People get hurt. So it's uh, it's it, it, it's something we're, we're we're very concerned about. We're always trying to make sure that the folks on uh, on the uh, on the ground really understand what they're dealing with. And you had mentioned, you know, do we see a, a difference in that? Um, that professionalization of um, of uh, user across the across the spaces, and most certainly, you know, when you've got a you've got a mega mine, when you've got you know five or six or seven hundred fifty megawatts um, on the ground, you can afford to have engineers, you know, involved, and um, and that's that's uh, that's that's key. It, it is, you know, if quite frankly, it is. Still still a, a new space. And even though we've got great minds on it, we've great, got great, you know, professional people involved um, on, on our customer side, I'm speaking, um, folks are still learning. And these are, um, are challenging even traditional um, data center uh, scales. So, uh, so we, we're always, we're always, you know, learning ourselves and trying to, trying to uh, work with our customers to, um, to uh, figure out, you know, how what we can do to 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 help and learn together. I feel like there's a few stories of uh, explosions or fireballs that uh, we can't talk about on the show, but I'm uh, sure maybe maybe yeah. one day over a beer we can we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's I tell you one thing we've we've seen that's that's really been. Um, been interesting. This may be a, a bit of a bit of a rabbit trail, but there's been um, such supply side constraint. You know, we can only build so many transformers in this company. But there has been a there has been an it, it, just a uh, an inrush of uh, of imported um, product that would typically have not been acceptable to the American industrial or utility markets. That's found its way to um, to crypto farms and. Uh, and that's, um, that's providing, provided entirely new learning experiences for, uh, for, for some, some folks. Um, so, so that's, that's been interesting to see, but it's, it's a maturing space. So overall, the space is maturing. Um, we're learning, our customers are learning and, uh, and it's, it's, it's exciting to be a part of all of that. Totally. Totally. So let's walk through like the, your guys' business structure and then also like how you guys, end up selling a transformer from like the beginning stages to when you're sending it off to maybe a crypto farm or working with someone else on selling one of these transformers. Okay. You bet. You bet. So, uh, so we have, there's kind of, kind of three, three lines of, of business. There is just custom built transformers. So this is where you come to us and here's a spec, you know, this is the transformer I want. It needs to be built and that's built at standard lead times, ours are, uh, you know, are, are competitive, but right now those are, those are crazy. They're like 30 plus weeks. Um, and you know, depending on the product, I mean, there's some eight to 10 week product. Um, but there's that custom bill. Then there's uh, stock. So this is a unique area that we play in the, in the transformer space where we're stocking a tremendous amount of, inventory that's that's ready to ship on a moment's notice so you can buy it custom made from stock or reconditioned and this has been a part of our business uh, this is the you know from from the very start but uh, reconditioned equipment has the advantage of uh, immediate availability and um that's 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 why people buy a reconditioned transformer you know you, you, we we see this in a lot of a lot of different industries right now. We're part of this thing called the Remanufactured Industry Council, and we see this on every you know every product class. If you're talking about consumer appliances or um, or industrial generators or you know whatever it is, the stresses of the supply chain lead a significant segment of consumers to look to reconditioned or remanufactured products just to uh, to solve that availability problem. So those are the three ways we go to market, you know, custom built stuff from our new stocking program. That's going to be your standard kind of uh, transformers and then uh, reconditioned transformers. So that's how we go to market, who we sell to. It's uh, it's the, the commercial industrial space. And that's 
when, when we say that, that's in our in our speak, that's differentiating from from utility customers. So the utilities just buy differently. They're you know they're buying you know many thousands of transformers at a time. They're buy, buying them on extremely low margin at um, long lead times. You know they're buying right now for 2025, and we're working with customers that you know need one yesterday. No, that's an interesting uh, conversation point is like these Bitcoin miners have come in and they just demanded so much resources so quickly just to be able to get more Bitcoin, right? What's it been like working with them specifically? It, they're obviously trying to push to get those transformers, to get any sort of infrastructure as fast as possible to get those those mines up, but you're hitting these supply constraints, right? Where I mean, you mentioned in the blog post that you uh, published December 2021, and we'll definitely include in today's show notes. Uh, you know, eight to ten weeks was standard back in the day, but now you said thirty-eight to forty weeks just to get something. So, how is it? Uh, how, what's the experience of working like with these Bitcoin miners who are just <laughs> probably just demanding these machines immediately? Well, it's it's frustrating, and we we feel their their pain. It's 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 bad. It's it's really bad. They they want uh, want to be online quicker, and many times the transformer is is the holdup. So it's. <laughs> It's stressful, man, and and you know to, to to feel that that stress on the on the you know the the other end um, certainly um, you know it's certainly something we we you know are trying to to respond to just just as as best we can. But there are just there are some fundamental uh, challenges to it, and a couple of things I mentioned in the article, but I think one thing I didn't even mention there is is the the regulatory pressures that we have uh, speci- specifically not to get too far into the weeds, but specifically with electrical vehicle chargers. So let me talk about that for just a second to kind of introduce an element here. So transformers uh, use, uh, there's two kinds of steel, uh, electrical steel, there's grain oriented steel and non grain oriented steel. Non, non grain oriented is used for the electrical vehicle chargers, uh, that, that consumes a tremendous amount of the world's supply of that. And, uh, transformers themselves require grain oriented. A, a steel mill has to decide, you know, what they're going to produce. Are they going to produce for EV chargers or for transformers? And the regulatory requirements to deploy so many electrical vehicle chargers in this country so fast are taking away the uh, the limited, the very scarce electrical steel that is required for transformers. So we're at this breakneck speed of developing out uh, a infrastructure in this country to support electrical vehicles. And at the same time, we're really cutting ourselves off at the knees by not allowing enough steel uh, for uh, for transformer production, which is paradoxically needed to power those EV chargers. So yeah. it's a real quandary we've got ourselves in. <laughs> yeah. This is interesting. I didn't even know anything about this. So let's riff on it for a second if we can. So Steel mills, from my understanding, the U.S. has basically gone through deindustrialization. I mean, I went to school outside Pittsburgh, right? Like, when you think of a better place to lay the landscape of deindustrialization, just like relics of steel mills everywhere. And even here in Colorado, there actually used to be a lot of coal and steel production. Um, you know, Pueblo, Colorado was the, the Pueblo of the West, or it was the uh, Pittsburgh of the West. Not anymore, right? So you're probably getting your steel from China, I would suppose, maybe other places. And then we have this regulatory constraint and you're basically breaking up the market by government mandate. Tell me a little bit more about that. Like what, what does it look like from beginning to end? Uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming most of the steel is coming from China. Well, uh, we've, we're able to actually, there is US source steel and that's, that's where most of ours um, comes from. But it is, it's a global market and it's one of those things... Uh, there's a whole space. I'm not deeply involved in in the you know in the sourcing of of those raw materials, but there is um, there is U.S. steel uh, production available. This is this is transformers are very much a global supply chain kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of build up. Uh, everything we we have is built here in the U.S. and uh, everything three phase uh, is three phase pad mount specifically are are built here in the U.S. But it's really it's really more of a raw materials challenge than than anything else, uh, and that that grain oriented steel that we need for transformers is uh, is is just 
is is just a scarce produced uh, commodity. And and I guess I, you know it, it's not it's not itself a raw material, but it's you know it's kind of a base component of you know like what we're talking about transformers and EV chargers, all that kind of stuff. So one more question on if I can. Yeah. If the market was normalized and if you, you didn't see this huge demand for EV materials from the government mandate, do you think like the price bidding up on these transformers would cause it to swing the other way where steel mills would probably produce transformers more? Or do you think it's difficult to say? Not, not, it's not, I, I do not think that would be the case. And that's because there, there are really other, uh, other factors at play here. The ability to take those raw materials and transform them into a finished good, like a, like a transformer is, you know, is going to then face labor constraints. And that was kind of the next thing that, that, um, that, that, that we see. We've got, um, We've just got a great challenge around the world, but in this, you know, if we were speaking about the North American and the um, United States specifically, uh, you know, we, we've got labor challenges and we've got systemic labor challenges due to our underlying demographics, and that's that's not an easy fix. It's not a quick fix. So, you know, we've got, uh, you know, we see people up and down our supply chain that, uh, you, know, you know, somebody in a manufacturing facility that. You know, is going to employ fifteen hundred uh, or employs fifteen hundred people right now, and they have three or four hundred jobs open. Like they would take three or four hundred people today, and uh, so so no. Once we get past that labor problem, um, then we've. I mean that uh, that base material problem. Uh, then we've we've got labor challenges, and then we've got we've got even beyond that kind of this macroeconomic trend of bringing bringing manufacturing back to the US and if you think you know there's there's it's in the news right now stuff like um bring back you know chip manufacturing right let's let's manufacture some of our own chips right and that's that's i think there's a big project in Rockdale Texas there's a big project out here uh in Portland Oregon where where I'm at there's i think there's something going on in in uh the Akron Cleveland, Ohio. Um, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of these, these fab facilities projects that are, that are going online. Those come onto our radar, uh, because they need transformers, but, um, but, um, but those, um, those guys are using, uh, those guys in terms of just anybody bringing manufacturing back to the US is uh, is putting more stress on the need for electrical infrastructure. So it's, you know, you can speak of that. I mean, there's there's different angles to that. Is that positive or, or negative? Uh, you know, I don't know. That's, that, that's kind of a, a different issue. But when we're bringing manufacturing back to the US, we we have to um, we have to build infrastructure that we no longer have in this this country and and or, or you know or at scales that we never had. So that's uh, yeah those those things. So I think if we if we think at those you know what's what's creating uh, stress on the supply chain specifically for electrical infrastructure, it's probably those three things. It's that that base material thing. It's the labor thing, and then it's it's the just demand that's being driven by um, the repatriation of 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 uh, industry. Yeah, let's go through the article a little bit more as well and get more in depth of it because I I'm assuming a lot of the things that you wrote six months ago, well, almost eight months ago now, are the same. But surely some things have changed a little bit as well. So just a, a quick summary. And correct me as I go through this. The, the two things that you saw off the top were the pandemic from COVID, the fallout from that, both the COVID hitting everyone and then also the response to COVID. And then the second thing was uh, the sandemic where people are just not working. And there's probably two parts to that. One, baby boomer generation is very large. It's not retiring. The next two generations were smaller, less people in the workforce. Uh, and then also perhaps less interest for people just to work these days. Uh, and then the other thing was, was babies are being born. So there's a lower population demographic changes, right? So uh, eight months on from what you wrote here, how are you seeing things from both those two points? And are you seeing things alleviate uh, somewhat for your business or in like the macro environment in general? 
Sure. Okay. So let's maybe start with what's not changed. There's demographic, there's underlying demographic trends, you know, uh, birth rates haven't changed, right? It, those, those are things that take uh, a tremendous, uh, a tremendous time to, uh, to address. And, um, so that hasn't changed. We can talk about, about some supply chain uh, stuff, and we have seen some relief there. Let's let's talk about the demographic thing for for just a second. What we're what we're looking at here is tr- underlying demographic trends that have uh, many countries such of our such as our own uh, with birth rates well below uh, well below uh, replacement rate. This has been known for a long time. Uh, a lot of us have been, you know, been very aware of that. It's not been as bad in, in the U S as it is in, in some other, other countries. Uh, I think I, I don't have, have the current numbers, but I know that, uh, that in, uh, in China right now, the birth rate is reported to be 1.1 and that is going to lead to a population of 1.4 million people today to being less than 600,000, 600 million people in 70 years. So that those kind of things now, 70, I think like 75 years is what the models have run out. In that sense, those seem like a long time, right? I mean, all of us are, are going to be past our, our Bitcoin mining days uh, at that that point. But um, but but our kids and our kids' kids, these are things that are going to change the shape of the world, and it will have an impact here in the United States as as well. Our our uh, our birth rates and birth rates plus immigration rates, you know, being uh, being as low as they are, do not um, uh, uh, do not fall off the cliff that, that badly. Uh, but they do, um, they do decline. We will have less people, uh, you know, less people in years ahead than we have now. We, we have a a trend that's, uh, for population reduction. And particularly, as you mentioned, like baby, baby boomers retiring, we're losing a lot of skill and experience and education that is in our workforce today and it's not not being replaced so those are those are some of the things that are not changing and uh and and as we look at how we how we approach maybe energy policy or running our own you know running our businesses uh you know uh uh, you know how we how we make make decisions those those are some of the things that are helpful to understand but um but it's in the category of those those matters that just are we're not going to really do anything um right at the the moment to change those when we shift to the the other other side of the supply chain um uh, the supply chain issues and and we think about those and how how we can interact with those uh we can we we can make there are short term things that we can do we can we can plan better we can stock equipment we can re- build redundancies and resiliencies into our into our business planning for us at Maddox, that looks like stocking a lot more equipment. That looks like building a lot to um, building to inventory instead of building to order, and um, and that's that's been been key for us. But there's there's different ways to kind of you do that in in different uh, in different businesses. Sometimes you can you know can carry carry bigger inventories and address it that way. Um, but uh, but you know a service business or you know other businesses would have would have great challenges doing that. You mentioned what's what's changed, and and we do see some slowing demand across all um, all manufacturing uh, sectors. So the, the activity is slowing down, and what does that mean for us? You know, we've got we've had, um, I guess, at the biggest level, we've had you know two consecutive quarters of contracting GDP. That's concerning. From you know the big R word, is it a recession? You know. Uh, th- this is all political. We won't censor you on the podcast. You can, you can go on the session if you want. <laughs> well, it's um, uh, we used uh, we, we used to or something that used to you know now it's like what what is the definition of a recession and um, but uh, but sure that's we see that um, we see we see certainly a tapering of of activity um, there and then you know the you know the reduction of um, the the dip whatever you want to call it the you know the, where we've got uh, the price of Bitcoin right now has 
moving very specifically to what we're talking about today, reduce demand for, uh, for transformers, for, um, for cryptocurrency mining, uh, specifically. So, um, so yeah, at the, at the biggest level, we see, uh, see contraction and certainly in the little space and in the, in the slice of time that we're in right now, uh, we're seeing reduced demand for, um, transformers for new, new crypto projects. And that in contrast to where we were talking, you know, eight months ago, um, yeah, that's, uh, that, 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 allows the transformer market itself to cool off a little bit. And, uh, the, the thing, like when I look at that as, as, you know, as leading this business, you know, I'm selling transformers. So that's great. You know, I, I want, I want more demand of, of transformers in that, in that kind of selfish, uh, selfish, uh, way at the same time, the market has been so overheated. We haven't been able to provide enough to meet demand. None, none of us. The entire industry. So, uh, cooling off just means having demand that's coming a step or two closer to theoretical maximum supply. So it's not it's not a concern for us. And oh no, what you know? Who's going to buy our transformers? Kind of kind of way. It's just uh, actually kind of approximating more um, more of a realistic supply uh, demand. Uh, match. Oh, that's really interesting. I haven't thought of it that way. And I, I would assume most consumers or people who are arm's length from any sort of industry like yourself would would expect that a fall in demand would lead to just like really suffering profits. But I guess that's not the case because we're not really seeing demand destruction at this point, or it's just going to take a while to see like a, a smoothing of uh, demand. Yeah. Well, so on, on our business, yeah, like on our side, yeah, it's not, um, we don't see, uh, you know, we're, our business is continuing to, um, to, to grow throughout this. And we've got so many, uh, I guess, you know, we've got regular industrial demand that is so, so backed up and, and congested that, uh, you know, it, we're, we're going to be building a lot more infrastructure in this country for the next next five years where we don't see any, any of the macro trends leading to a reduction in, in a need for, for, for transformers. But, but we're, we're very attuned to what's happening in, in the crypto space because it's uh, you know, it does allow us to, to dedicate uh, more production capacity elsewhere. And uh, we've, we've had, even some interesting opportunities lately to buy um, to buy back some projects that we sold a couple couple years ago, and this is not you know it's not to the blood and the water kind of kind of stage, um, but there are guys who are highly leveraged and went out there and on you know speculation built out you know projects and their production costs their mining costs um, are are maybe not viable at the moment. And so, uh, we've been able to, um, we've been able to buy back some of that equipment, sell it to more, frankly, better run operations. Um, and, uh, this is weeding out some of the, um, less economically disciplined players. And, and, uh, um, so, uh, you know, we do, you know, we deal in surplus equipment and, and, uh, reconditioned equipment as, as well. So we've been able to, uh, yeah, like I, like I said, um, help help some people trying to get out of a project, uh, sell back their equipment, and uh, find a you know we've been able to find new homes for it. Yeah, there's an interesting parallel between what you're saying right now and what I'm seeing with Bitcoin mining, with ASICs, with other infrastructure, and then even with we get into like the finance sector where there there are some distressed companies, but for the most part, we haven't seen like any wa- like large washouts yet. There's been some rumors of a few liquidations. There's definitely been some distressed assets being sold off, like Celsius mining, but it, you could almost say that's not really because of the mining operation. It's entirely because of what else Celsius was up to. Uh, but I have not yet seen any large miners or large private miners just completely explode. Uh, I've seen or heard of smaller operations that were highly leveraged start selling off their assets and putting themselves in a more competitive position or just getting out of the business because they weren't ready to jump into it yet. So that's it's interesting. I'm wondering if it's going to change or turn. And I'm going to throw that question back to you. What would make this market go into uh, you know, blood in the water mode like, like you talked about? It seems like for electric infrastructure, 
it's quite safe because there's been so much pent up demand for years. Like you guys could just continue to do that. Uh, for Bitcoin mining, that's not always the case, right? Because it's so retail driven. Exactly. No, that's 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 a good observation there, and, and you're exactly right. In in our business, it's not. Um, I mean, we uh, we we love the crypto space. We have been supporters of it um, from the very start, and and will be um, will be on an ongoing basis. So we love the space. Love working with the people. Uh, you know, or like the projects. You know, uh, you believe in what's what's going on, and always want to be a part of that. It's not. Uh, it's if it was to experience a you know a um, a massive uh, contraction even beyond what we've seen here we have many many other uh, we have we have other customers who would who would easily absorb that that capacity so it's not a um it, it's not um as as vulnerable a situation as a, a miner themselves who could be very much um well, very vulnerable, frankly, to energy prices, and that's 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 going to be the the main thing, right? I mean, there's always talk of you know, yeah, what does regulation um, do? Are we talking, you know, mining licenses in Texas? Are we talking, you know, getting you know, getting um, legislated out of certain states or jurisdictions? You know, there's there's very uh, there's there's some of those threats, but to just the, the plain economics of it is you know what what is what is the price of energy, and that that vulnerability is you know that's an existential threat to to uh, to to miners, and I, uh, I I don't feel super qualified to, to to speak on that. There's other guys you've had other guests actually that uh, that I've I've uh, listened to, and I'm I am uh, paying attention, but um, but we're we're just a small part of this. We're supplying the the transformers. So, uh, so our, our, we're in a, we're in a, I guess a different situation, uh, a sympathetic, but not directly affected. Um, okay. Last question for you, magic wand, change anything you want within supply chain conditions within your business or within the business that you sell into, what would it be like one wish list item? Well, if I was to put it, and I'll, I'll put it directly onto the the crypto mining space. Crypto miners use a two forty volt. This is a very, <laughs> this is a really simple thing. But all right, you got my magic wand out here. All uh, everybody's uh, using um, using uh, two hundred forty volt uh, power supplies, right? If the entire industrial transformer market in the U.S. uses 277 volt secondary power, and if crypto miners were able to use 277 volt uh, power supplies, any crypto miner could use any available transformer already existing in the supply chain. So that's what I would change. And what that would do is instead of, you know, we've got a guy, you know, got guys all the time, hey, we need we need, you know, 500 megawatts of um of transformers transforming from some utility voltage down to down to 240. Okay, well I got to build those from scratch. That's going to take me x number of weeks. That, that's my answer right now. If they could use 277, I would be okay. How's Tuesday? Is that going to work for you? You know, it, they could utilize the existing uh, infrastructure, and that would all that would <laughs> that would not only allow them immediate access to all the transformers in our stocking program and existing in the supply chain, but would mitigate the risk in the sense that if if they are having to sell off those assets, they're not custom built crypto transformers. They're now transformers that can be used for the Amazon distribution center or, um, you know, whatever. They're, they're perfectly exchangeable on on the market. So you're going from a custom built transformer specifically for crypto mining to just a garden variety um, industrial transformer that can be used for any application. That would go a long way to solving the supply chain issues on the uh, crypto side of transformer consumption. Okay, there we go. Uh, Bitmain, what's miner? Anyone is listening to this, you heard it. You got to get that changed. Uh, and then thank you so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast. Really appreciate your insights. This was a lot of information we have not had on the show to date. So really, again, appreciate the, the time. And Thank you, Will. It's good to be here. Appreciate what Compass is doing and glad to be here with you today.